Okay, so can you lift up your Bible and we'll pray? You don't have to stand, but if it's on your phone, that's okay too. We want to honor the word of the Lord. And we know, Lord, your, your ways are high above our ways. And the title today is Abraham Staggered Not at the Promise of God. That's come from Romans chapter 4, verse 20. And Lord, we say, may it be true of us as your people that we will stagger not at the promises of God, that our faith will be strengthened, not weakened by the world, but strengthened by your presence in our lives, strengthened by the example that Jesus set for us, strengthened by the power of your furnace on the inside of our hearts, which is the Holy Spirit and the fire on the altar of our hearts. Lord, let us be burning for you. And that, that example that you set, Lord, as the Father that loves us. Give us another kingdom key today about experiencing your embrace. I'm going to say it again. Give us another kingdom key today to understand how to experience our true Father's embrace. In Jesus' name, amen. So I always bring more than I can cover. I try not to talk too fast, but that's the goal is to talk about keys today that can help us get greater revelation, greater strength. Can you look at somebody and say, you need to strengthen your faith. <laughs> Me too. That's all. Just say that. Me too. I'm not picking on you. We all need to strengthen our faith. So that's the subtitle today. Abraham staggered not. That's the old King James language, and I loved it. From the first time I read that, I said, wow, that really helps me because I played football. And I was staggered a few times when I got hit by somebody bigger than me. Or sometimes I actually just bounced off of people that were so big and strong like a fire hydrant, like you hit them with everything you had, and you were staggered. So I could really relate when it said he staggered not at the promise of God. And then keys to strengthening our faith. There's got to be a reason, right? There's got to be a reason. And again, I don't want to editorialize too much, but a lot of people in the church for one reason or another, seem to plateau at some point. And the Bible calls that lukewarm, and we know that's not good. So I'm going to try to share some keys to strengthen in our faith today. And the verse that we get this staggered knot from is verse 19 in Romans 4, being not weak in faith. Say, I am not weak in faith. we got to make some declarations. Say, I am not weak in faith, just like Abraham. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. It's very hard for us in America to consider not. You know, we're so good at looking and analyzing and figuring things out, and we keep saying, but this, but this, right? All these what-if games, what if this happens? Well, look, what if I believe the Word of God? I'll save a whole lot of energy, wouldn't I? Yeah, what if I believe the Word of God? I'm not going to consider the facts here above the Word. I'll look at the situation. I'm not going to ignore them either, but I'm going to look for the tools that he gave me. Neither did Abraham consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He was 100. She was 90. You could understand why they might have been considering his own body. He's considered not his own body, figuratively dead. And he staggered not at the promise of God through what? Right. Unbelief. That's something we continually should ask the Lord to help give us power to destroy strongholds of unbelief in our life. And... You don't always know they're there, so if you ask them as part of this fast to reveal, do I have a stronghold of unbelief? I could believe other people for prayer. I could pray for their healing, but I don't think you want to heal me. Right? There's all kinds of confusing things that happen. And then it says he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And now look at somebody and say, I am strong in faith. And you are strong in your faith. That's right. You know, you heard Trisha when she came up here now, she dealt with a very low self-image, she dealt with a lot of rejection and depression. And I watched when we got married, the difference between when we first got married and now, or even when we first started dating, is off the chart different person that I live with, which is what all believers should be believing for, is that we keep on growing closer into the nature of God. And that's why we have to strengthen our faith, because the devil is a really good liar. You know, he's the father of lies. But we have the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. That was a great gift. Thank you, Lord. So the first key I'm putting down is faith produces fruit. Say it. Faith produces fruit. Good fruit. So in the, in the message in 2 Corinthians 5, we're, we're used to seeing this as the verse that talks about how we have to walk by faith and not by 
sight, right? So here he says, you won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Now, look, that doesn't mean if you're a Christian and you're going through something that you can't feel a little down about something. But that's when you get on the phone to a person to pray, not somebody who's going to pour more, oh, you're so, you're in such bad shape. No, you, you want to get somebody on the phone who's a warrior, like T. <laughs> Don't you be discouraged. God's going to pull you through this, right? As long as it took, she would pray. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. These cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions that we're going to have ahead. This is a part I love. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. It's say it. It's what we trust in but don't yet see. Some of you don't want to cooperate today. It's what we trust in, but don't yet see. I don't know. I'm getting some dirty looks. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? Thank you. No. That was number one. Faith produces good fruit. Right? You, you keep a certain optimism about you in your spirit. I know what it looks like, but God. That's not living in denial. That's choosing to believe what you can't see yet, but because you know it's there, you, you, you may not have physically seen Jesus, but you know he's there because he's made himself real to you. And that's what we choose to focus on. The second one, the key, is that what I'll call first principles. Has anybody heard of this uh, idea? Like you hear it a lot in science, right? That's where I heard it through my son who, hallelujah, finished his Ph.D. Seven years. Oh, my God. You can't imagine how much work he went through. But I can because I was on the phone with him the whole time. Actually, when he was in the crib, I was saying, S-A-T, S-A-T. Because <laughs> I, I have my own mistakes about that, and I wanted him to know you, it's good if you have choices in life, right? You want to put, put the work in. So first principles is that we have faith in something. That's true for all of humanity. Everybody has faith in something. But our very first principle is faith in God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three, that's God. The faith in God is the first principle for a Christian. And that's what it says in Hebrews 11.1. 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that we can't see. That's what we just read in Corinthians, right? Faith is about trusting that the thing is there even though you can't see it yet. And that's hard to do. But that's why it's really good to be surrounded by other Christians who are not lukewarm, who have not plateaued, but who are excited because they're seeing God move in their lives. Now, again, that's not trying to rank people, but who do you want praying for you? Somebody who believes that God's going to heal you. It matters. When Jesus went to pray for somebody, he put everybody out of the room except his leaders that were there with him. Why? They weren't bad people, but their faith wasn't where, where it needed to be in order to believe for that. Now, that's, again, we have to be careful not to make rules. Well, maybe the reason I didn't get healed is because I didn't have enough faith. Who's speaking that in your ear? Right? Who's trying to shame you? Who's the accuser of the brethren? Instead of looking like I'm defective, say, Lord, give me more strength. Strengthen my faith. Abraham was not weak in his faith, but he was strong. He was staggered not by the hit from the devil. But, but he chose to, to believe in the Lord. So I'll give you an example. My son was the one that told me about this many years ago. He's currently at UPenn, and they have this children's hospital in Philadelphia there. And the man that he got signed off on, on the Ph.D., had this young girl as, uh, as a patient. Her name's Emily Whitehead. She was nine years old. She had severe leukemia, and she had two weeks to live on the best diagnosis. And, and this man that he works for, named Carl June, um, had been an expert in HIV. I have a reason for telling you all this. I'm not going to keep it real long, but he was an expert in HIV. His wife died of cancer, so he decided to change his career from HIV to cancer research as a, as a memorial to his wife. Everybody should, all the women should say, oh, man, that's amazing, right? He was going to spend the rest of his life trying to help other people avoid what she had to go through. That's amazing, right? So on the left is what she looked like with two weeks to live. On the right is 10 years later. <laughs> 10 years later. That's a whole lot longer than two weeks. Now, I'm just going to say it wasn't because people went in and, and prayed necessarily. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about first principles here. 
He's a, he's a great scientist, but he operated in the principle that I'm trying to share with all of us is that God gave him a great gift, and he chose to use it for good. He chose to use it to try to save lives. Because if anybody has seen your child suffer, there's nothing worse. And imagine going to a hospital every day where you're dealing with parents whose children are being given a diagnosis of two weeks to live. That's your day job. You're there 40 or 50 hours a week. How much tenacity of your spirit would you need not to get depressed and not to take that home, but to be a light for those people? And huh, most people would trade their life for their child to not see them suffer. So he, he, what he, um, the first principle that he applied is that he was an expert on the HIV virus, and he knew it was a terrorist killer. What's different about this man is he said, well, what if we change the HIV virus from killing humans to killing cancer? <laughs> Smart guy. I think that was a God idea. Even though he might not be a professing Christian, who created the whole universe? And when you want to solve a problem, sometimes you have to skin away all of the fluff. And you got to major on the majors. Well, if this thing is so good at killing people, maybe I can train it to kill cancer and not kill the patient. Because <laughs> what he did was he, he, he gene edited the person. Each person needs their own specific treatment because we all are different. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. He figured out how to tr treat this little girl so that her immune system would be the thing that killed the cancer. Not chemo, not radiation, not drugs, her own system. He figured out how to rewire her system so that it would only kill the cancer and not kill her. Talk about threading the needle. She looks pretty good. From 9 to 19, she looks pretty good. Right? Like, why wouldn't God give us those kind of ideas? Sometimes it's because of fear, right? We don't think, well, God, that sounds impossible. Well, nothing's impossible for God. And there's plenty of more stories like it. So it's this faith, of, faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to give us those kind of ideas. And again, like, I used to panic. If I couldn't find my keys, I'd start backtracking, looking everywhere. I know, where was it? I'd get all frantic. You don't make good decisions when you're frantic. You know that? Now I've just decided, Lord, you know where that is. You know where that is. I'm not going to stress about this. I'm going to look, but I'm not going to look like a chicken with my head cut off. I believe you're going to show me where it is. It works. I'm telling you, you should try it. It's way better. A lot less stress. So this is how the Message Bible says, Hebrews 1 and 2. It says, the fundamental fact of existence. <laughs> See how it's first principles? The fundamental fact of existence for a Christian is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. Thank you, Eugene Peterson. Our faith is the handle on the thing that we can't see. It's the substance of what we're hoping for, the evidence of what we don't yet see in the natural. What if that mom could have said, can you imagine that she's going to look like this, and 10 years from now, she's going to look like this. Just say, Lord, touch my imagination that I could believe for a miracle. We should probably touch our hearts too, right? Because it's not just our heads, but because it's by faith we confess. We believe in our heart, the Bible says, not just in our mind. We believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. Is it going to work 100% of the time? Man, would it be great if I could just say yes. The only way that could have been the answer is if Adam and Eve never sinned in the garden. They did that. You can deal with them when you see them in heaven. That's fine. But that's the reality that we're all facing now, okay? It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. It's an act of faith. Not just saying that you believe it, but acting on your faith. Peter didn't just say he believed it. He went out of the boat. And walked on the water. I know he gets criticized, but man, anybody here walked on the water? Uh, okay, let's just keep it in perspective. He showed a lot of faith there. Hebrews 11, I'll keep going. That second key, it says in, in verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now, I know you know these verses, but these are the first principles of Christians. If people really believe this, they wouldn't plateau. 
They wouldn't level off. They would keep exercising their faith, and that's what the Bible says, who by reason of use grow in that gift. If you're not exercising it, or if you're confessing, like Trisha said, confessing over yourself things that God is not saying about you, then you're in agreement with the wrong boss. You're, you're lining up with the father of lies. Say about yourself what God says about you and not what other people might have said about you. So we have to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We're not just biding our time until he comes back and gets us out of here. We're receiving rewards for acting on our faith. Do we make mistakes? Of course we do. Nobody's perfect. But by keeping on trying, that's why David was called a man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. Abraham made a lot of mistakes. But they staggered not at the promises. They repented and they moved on. Amen. There's a lot to preach on that. So then, Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. That's a first principle. Romans 10 goes on to say in verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now you're already saved, but you have to think about the, the additional growth process that the Bible calls sanctification. Everybody familiar with this? I don't have a whole lot of time. But sanctification says when you get in, you're drinking milk. And as you grow in your walk, you go from milk to meat. You mature. You grow. God is right to expect more of us as we're growing in him than he did when we were first saved. That's not a problem. That's a good father. Right? So if he's a good father, he has the right to expect of us. And you can think about Moses. This is tricky, right? Because here he was. He had led them amazingly. But just because God said, I want you to speak to the rock, and he chose to strike the rock, that was specific to him that, you know what, that's going to keep you out of the promised land. Because the, the responsibility increases the more God trusts you with his people. And I'm not saying that to say, well, you shouldn't want to be involved as a leader. No. We want to be the ones that, that got the gifts and went and traded with them. One got two, one got five. God said the same thing to both of them. Well done. You doubled, you know, you doubled what you were given. Only the one who didn't use what he had. Right? So we don't back off our responsibility, but he said, in my heart, I'm going to believe that God raised him from the dead. I'm going to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. But I can be saved from today, even though I'm a Christian, I can be saved from the wages of sin, which is still available. Who signs that paycheck? Who are you working for? You work for the devil. His checks bounce. I could be saved from wrong thinking that would cause me to get a wrong check that's going to bounce. I'm in finance. I can't help it. But also the other thing I can be saved from is my, my, my nature, the human nature in me that will try to resurrect from the crucifixion that I just gave it. You know that happens, right? When we bring in a sacrifice to the altar, it's got to be crucified. You can't have the resurrection unless you have the crucifixion. And nobody likes that part, but... But my nature can change. That's what Peter told us, that we can participate. We can be partakers of the divine nature of God. We don't have to be victim of this carnal nature that, that still tries to, to resurrect. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Say it. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Not just initial salvation to come into the kingdom, but all along our walk of sanctification as we're growing in the Lord. And that's right for him to expect that of us, just like you do for your children. For the scripture says in Psalm 25, 3, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Anybody here? Yeah, you believe on him, you will not be put to shame. Third key, God's covenant justice of faith. I really like that expression. Maybe I'll unpack it another day. But it says in Romans 4, verse 13, the promise didn't come to Abraham or to his family through the law. Who's writing Romans? Okay, Paul, right. He knew the law pretty well, didn't he? He was like expert Harvard grad in the law, but he realized he came to a whole different revelation. He said, everything that I used to count as valuable, I consider it like trash. Every way I put value in myself by how good I could follow the law, I, rec I recognize now that's not God's heart. It doesn't mean the Bible was wrong, but he made it really clear that the reason God gave the law was to show us that we can't keep it and that we need him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And here's some rules to follow. Don't kill each other. <laughs> Don't steal. Don't lie. Thank you, Lord. The world doesn't know that one. The promise didn't come to him or his family through the law. The promise came through the covenant justice of faith. I just love that expression. I did a wedding yesterday, right? It was, it was amazing to do a memorial service on Friday that was so moving and so anointed, and then to do a wedding the next day. So one person is checking out with salutes of an amazing job, and now a new entity is formed. Two that were separate become one. And they're going to have children. In Jesus' name, they're going to have children. And now another new creation, a miracle happens from that commitment that they made to each other. Perfect? Of course not. But ha living in a family that's going to love them and show them and help them learn from all the mistakes, help them avoid all the bumps on the head that we got along the way, yes, came through the covenant justice of faith. I'm telling you, Abraham, I've looked at your heart, and I want you to go outside and look up at the stars in the sky. Even though you're 100 years old and your wife's 90, your descendants are going to be more you're going to flourish more. They're going to be more numerous than all the stars you could see. Because he believed. Amazing. He had enough faith. He didn't try to consider his body being dead and his wife being 90. No. He just believed. Wow. That's covenant justice. God counts our faith as covenant justice. How many people here were drug dealers or drug addicts or people like me? You can raise your hand. I'm, I'm raising mine. I wasn't even a very good one, but thank God he protected me from getting arrested. Like, even that guy can get in the kingdom. Because in Paul's world, they, they, they weren't reaching out to the pagans. But through the love of God, every one of us here, regardless of our background, regardless. Paul himself was a murderer. So, yeah, but he was still, still locked into that thing of do they need to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the law? God is saying, no, the covenant justice of faith. You believe, you're in. That's what I need. It's by faith so that it can be in accordance with grace and so that the promise can be validated for the entire family, every nation, tribe, and tongue. It says in Revelation, that's us. There's nobody beyond the reach of God. I'm sure glad that's true. <laughs> and then in Romans 14, it says, not simply those who are from the law, the Jews, but those who share the faith of Abraham. Anybody here share the faith of Abraham? Come on, let's just say yes. By faith, I say it. I'm one of his descendants. I'm one of those stars that he was looking up in the sky because we inherited this covenant promise. Ho, oh, thank you, who have the faith of Abraham. He's the father of all of us. Just as the Bible says, I've made you the father of many nations. He didn't just come for one nation, neither did Jesus. This happened in the presence of the God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead. Not just me, right? And calls into existence things that did not exist. That girl in that picture. Somehow, I'm saying God was in that somehow because... Something got called into existence that never existed before. Her whole immune system shifted. She never took a drug, never took radiation, never took chemo. Ten years later, she's stronger now because her immune system knows even if it comes back, it's going to kill it. Come on. I mean, that's not a godly example of what the Word does, what the Spirit does on the inside of us. Our immune system keeps getting stronger. The lies change the way they're presented, but it's all the same root lie. And that's why we need these keys. I'm starting to spit up here. I'm liking that. <laughs> don't, don't sit too close to the front. So fourth key, grace and faith to run the race. It's a tongue twister, isn't it? Grace and faith to run the race. So here's one of the things I found as a pastor that gets confusing to people because it's, it can't be any of, any of our works on the way in to get saved, right? There's nothing you could have done to get saved. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But people confuse that, or they would say in business, they conflate it with thinking that once I'm saved, I shouldn't work because it looks like I'm trying to earn favor with God. But that's really contrary to Scripture. It's contrary to the whole thing I mentioned already. The sanctification process requires our engagement. If you go to AA, you know, you're meeting with people all the time, and you're working the steps, 
that's good. It's Christian. It's based on Christian principles. It's amazing the results they've had. So here in Hebrews 12, he says, let us drop every extra weight, every sin that clings to us and slackens our pace and let us run with endurance the long race set before us. See, that's not the salvation that we're talking about. That's this idea, Dick Smith, when you became a Christian, you entered a race. You came in through the gate of God. You came and became accepted in the kingdom of God. And you now got a new passport that said you're an ambassador for, for the kingdom for, of Christ. But now it's still up to us what we do with that passport. How we activate that inside of us, see? So once you know your true identity, which is going to be another key coming up, once we know that we're sons and daughters of a living God, we have a reason to get up every morning. We want to find out what our assignment is for today. We want to get the download of the daily strategy that God has for me today. The longer term plan. What career do you want me to have? What job do you want me to have? Pray with people. Get them to pray. There's so many churches now that have people on staff, businesses, businessmen in our church that pay somebody to pray for the business and then consult them and then ask them, what's the Lord showing you about this? Why wouldn't we do that? Of course we do that. Okay, so there you go. I'm spitting again. Let us run with endurance this long race that's set. And, and then in 1 Corinthians 9, he's using the same example. You've seen athletes race. Everyone runs. Only one wins, but run to win. Let's, why don't we train to win the race? You could be happy that you just finished the race. That's good. But why not train to win? Hmm, that's what Paul's saying. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades we are after one that's gold eternally. Only one wins, but if we're all trying to win, then we're all doing better by being with each other. Because you're holding me up when I need help, I'm holding you up when you need help. Not like, oh, well, you know, I used to try, prayed about things, but I didn't see the answer, so I gave up. That's not the faith of Abraham, okay? Not trying to shame anybody. We know how easy it is to get discouraged, so that's why we have prayer up here every week. So that you don't have to leave here feeling like nobody stood in agreement with me for the need that I'm going through, right? All right, here we go. Key number five. I'm up to five. Somebody should be happy. <laughs> Psalm 124, I quoted it already today. If God hadn't been for us, Israel, sing out. If God hadn't been for us, when everyone went against us, we would have been swallowed alive by their violent anger. Swept away by the flood of rage. We would have lost our lives in the wild, raging war. You heard Steve Kasienko, right, when he was here? Yeah, he was a drug dealer when he got saved. He was at the Market Street Mission. He owed money to one of the mafia families. <laughs> so you're the pastor, and he comes and says, what should I do? I owe them money. Should I pay them back? But now that I'm saved, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. I'm like, dude, you know, like, we got to pray about this one. Let's fast and pray because you got to hear God, right? You don't want to be tuned into the wrong channel on this one. And I told you last week or whenever, yeah, was it last week? So much has happened. He, uh, I said, I think, I think the Lord wants you to pay it back. I think you want to do the right thing. You don't want to now live in the, king, in the enemy's kingdom by stealing that money from them. You go to them and you say, you know what? I'm sorry. I forgot to pay you. <laughs> Here's a little extra interest. However you do it, you know, and he was brave enough to do it. And the guy said, you know what? No big deal. You don't have to pay me back. One of the guys. One of them took the money. The other one said, saw such a change in him. You can't, you can't know that in advance. I'm not saying, you know, there's any kind of steadfast rule other than pray. Pray and obey. Fast and pray. And then as long as you know you're hearing from the Lord, will you be right 100% of the time? No. Will we counsel with you? Yes. And then we all move forward through life. Some steps forward, some steps back. That's not a negative confession. It's all part of this growing process. All right? And then it goes on to say in Psalm 124 in the message, Blessed be God. He didn't go off and leave us. He didn't abandon us, defenseless, helpless as a rabbit in a pack of snarling dogs. We've flown free from their fangs, free from their traps, free as a bird. Anybody been around long enough to remember that song? My soul escaped like a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I got a couple of amens. I guess, I guess that was a long time ago. Their grip is broken. We are free as a bird in flight. God's strong name is our help. The point here, the key is gratitude strengthens our faith. 
When you come at the Lord and say, where would I be without you, Lord? Another day that you're giving me, I'm, I should have been dead. So the fact that I'm even here helps me not to complain. Because I got another day to be about my father's business. Amen. Now we're at six. Oh, boy. And you're thinking, how many are there? 42? Seven. See, you're on six. You should be happy. Coffee's on the way. John 6. Oh, God, this gets me. John 6. I am the bread that gives life. If you come to my table, you will never go hungry. So what's the key? Kingdom identity strengthens my faith. Kingdom identity that I know, like I said to Dick, that when he got saved, he became a citizen of another kingdom. He got a new passport. It's really dual citizenship because you're, you're in the world. You're just not of the world. When Jesus prayed to the Father, he said, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. I'm just praying that you give them the strength they need to, to change the world. You laughing at me or somebody else? Oh, the baby. Oh, sorry. I should have known. It wasn't me. <laughs> he wants some money, man. He's, he's got to make a deposit. <laughs> We'll make it where there's a trap door underneath the basket. And once you push it in, it goes down under. I'm the bread that gives life. Man, think about that. If I understand my kingdom identity, that I'm first a son, first a daughter, not confused. I'm a son or daughter of the living God before anything else, Italian, whatever ethnic background, whatever, anything. First son and daughter of the king. And that was another thing, Jim, that we could feel so strongly, the sense of family among all the people that were honoring tea. And, and this, this kindred spirit that we all have of the Holy Spirit and the word being the guide to our life and, and how that we understand why we call each other brother and sister. And, and some people that live in this part of the world, they don't have any family around here. They got transferred in. Or like I was talking to somebody at the wedding yesterday. He came here when he was 16 years old from Guatemala. His father died when he was nine, right? Didn't know English. Here he is all these years later with his own construction company. Wow. You know, like, wow, amazing what people will do. Bread of life. I'm the bread. Jesus is saying, I give you life. You come to my table and eat, you'll never go hungry. Believe in me and you'll never go thirsty. All that my father gives to me, come to me and I will receive every one of them. Say it. He will receive every person that comes to him. He doesn't look at your resume and say, my people will get back to your people. You come to him. I will receive every single one that comes to me. You should underline that verse. I will not send away anyone who comes to me. My identity is as a son of the living king. He didn't reject me. He won't reject me. He might correct me. That's because he loves me. Not so bad. It's okay. Everyone who sees and believes in the Son will live eternally. I'm the one who will resurrect him. I could go on about that one right there. We're continually going through a death and resurrection process in this area of sanctification. We have to lay down the old things that are trying to weigh us down. That's what it said in Hebrews. Put aside the weight that's stopping you from running faster. You want to win the race, you put down the weights, so those sins, besetting sins, is how it says it, I believe, in the King James. Lay down those besetting sins. They don't compare in value to what God has in store for you, but they slow you down if they're still hanging on. And then in John 3, one of my favorite all-time verses, now before the feast of the Passover, you know, this is uh, what you see here, right, the, the love that he had. When Jesus knew that his hour, I think it should say John 13, that's a typo. It should say John 13, not, not 3. I believe. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Anybody here in that role? Anybody here known by Jesus? He never rejects you. No matter what, he will love you to the end. He will love you to the end. Having loved them, he loved them to the end. He got down and washed their feet. The lowest rung of the social ladder was the person on the staff who had to do the front door washing of the feet. He said, I'm not above any role. Anybody who comes to me, I'm a man well acquainted with grief. 
I understand. In all ways I was tempted like you, yet without sin. I will make a way of escape no matter what situation you're in. If you'll seek me, I'll be the way maker for you. He loved them to the end. And then in John 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. And hopefully that kingdom identity is just you're feeling the love of God starting to wrap around your, your body right now. Because if I know that he can't reject me, he won't reject me, then, then it's up to me now to just yield to the Father's embrace. Amen? And I'm going to go to that one now. That's key number seven. We, our strength grows, our faith is strengthened when we can internalize, I don't care what word you use, if you can metabolize it, if you know that you are experiencing the Father's embrace, nothing else is as valuable as knowing that that's the relationship that you have with the Father. It's a very sensitive topic because we automatically think word Father, we think of our earthly fathers and they weren't perfect people, right? We, we say often, you have to believe they did the best they could. In, in, in the Bible, it's very clear. The first commandment with a promise is honor your mother and father only when they're honorable. <laughs> yeah. No conditions. Honor them. You can't project back into the past. You don't know what they went through to get there, wherever they were. You got to believe they were doing the best that they could. And that he is not like your earthly parents, right? Like he's far above. His thoughts are far above. And when I can experience that embrace, and that's the title of a book that we use in our men's group by Jack Frost, a minister named Jack Frost, experiencing the Father's embrace. He had gone to Toronto during the outpouring, a very legalistic, broken Christian with a broken marriage, and his wife was there with him. And he writes, I brought her there so that God would straighten her out. <laughs> we watch her language, right? Watch her language. So while they're in there, he's getting wrecked by the Holy Spirit, right? He hadn't been in an environment like what was happening in Toronto during that outpouring and at the Toronto Airport um, Church up there. I'm sure some of you have been there, right? Went there while that revival was going on. And while he was sitting there, one of the ministers on the altar said, Father, I know that there's people in here who have never experienced your embrace. And I pray that you would embrace them right now and let them know that you are real. <sighs> Busted. Jack Frost just got busted right there on the spot. That was him. He had never experienced a father's embrace because his father had been abusive. Like that, that's just the only word you could use. So to think of God as a loving father for this man who ended up ministering here at our church and staying at our house. We got to know him. It's an amazing guy. He has passed since then. But uh, just a, an incredible book. I highly recommend it. But the point is, it's one of the hardest things for Christians to do. In my 40 years of being a Christian and trying to help people, we can talk about it. It's just not always so easy to actually experience the embrace. And that's what that man was praying from the altar that day. Lord, I don't want them to just know about it in their mind. I want them to experience your embrace. Amen? So what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What are you, what are you bummed out about in the old hippie language? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how he shall not with him also freely give us all things. <laughs> who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The devil. <laughs> it's God who justifies, who is he that condemns. It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? also makes intercession for us. I feel like we have to stand. This is just too good to sit. <laughs> it's one of those times I just want to say thank you for this truth. Thank you that if God be for us, who can be against us? How can I allow the negativity to rise up in my heart to overflow what I know about God already? Well, it happens. It's okay. No condemnation, right? That's in Romans. There is now no condemnation. To those who are in Christ, I want to be in Christ. How about you? I want to experience the Father's embrace. I want, to be, I want to be so in love with the Word of God that it draws me to want to read it and read it in different versions and read it in a way that I can apply it to my daily life and my job situations and that I would hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what Jesus said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will be filled. 
and I want to have a relationship with Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, where I recognize his voice. I submit myself to him. I say, I want to yield to your direction in the way you want me to make decisions today, in the way you want me to interact with everybody. So this is kind of worth repeating together. Say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's not the easiest verse to, to chew on, is it? But remember I said there's a constant progression of crucifixion and resurrection. Crucifixion, resurrection. I let old things die. He said, pick up your cross daily. I let the old things die. I let the old nature die. And I said, Lord, give me that new nature. I can be a partaker of the divine nature. I'm asking for it now. I want to be transformed into your image with ever-increasing glory. So verse 37, ready? Coming down the home stretch. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I think that deserves a reprise. <laughs> Let's turn up the volume a little. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. Oh, man, say it. I am persuaded, completely persuaded, that neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, shout to the Lord. Nobody but you, Lord. There's nobody but you that can bring us to that kind of deliverance and freedom and love and I'm just going to ask you to do another prophetic act. Give yourself a hug. And say, Lord, help me experience the Father's embrace. Help me experience your love at a level I've never understood it before. Not in my mind, Lord, in my heart, in my soul, to the depths of the depravity that I've had to experience in my life. I want to feel your embrace and know that you're going to comfort me in the midst of that trial in the midst of the healing that I have to go through, not just physical healing, but the emotional healing of the trauma or, or the, the torture or whatever problems happened to me when I was younger. Lord, I know that you are trustworthy. Can you just pray in the spirit for a minute? Remember I said that, that download of strategy. Lord. Downloads of strategy. Downloads of your love. Agape. Unconditional love. Fill us that we would know your embrace. That our st strength would rise. Our faith would be strengthened in our relationship with you. Not by our might. Not by our power. But by our submission. Not my will, your will be done. I trust you, Lord. To say that, I trust you, Lord. I give you my life. You are trustworthy. All my life you have been faithful. So, so good. And your goodness is running after me, Lord, right now. Running after me. So, Lord, we just ask you to move. You know every person here. You know every person watching online. You know, you were present when we were conceived in our mother's womb. You know our DNA. You know everything about us. And we just submit ourselves to you and say, have your way in my life. Have your way in my life. Break the idolatry that has crept in. I tear down those false idols that I've erected, Lord. It's okay, just admit it, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. We all misplace our affections on things. Can you say this prayer with me? Lord, show me where I have ungodly beliefs, where I've been in agreement with lies from the enemy. 
I reject those agreements right now. I cancel those agreements. I renounce those behaviors and ask you to cleanse me from any defilement that was brought, but also from any guilt that the enemy would try to put on me. I am not defective. I am your son, accepted in the beloved, and I have a place at my Father's table today, and I will eat at your table and declare the goodness of the Lord. Come on, you know the rest. In the land of the living, I will declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Everybody said, amen. Give a shout. You're good, Lord. You're good, Lord. All my life, you have been faithful. You have been so, so good. <laughs> so the altar's open. You know, maybe the Lord's been stirring in you. I hope he has, that your strength could be, your, your faith could be strengthened any one of a number of ways. I gave you seven. There's probably seven billion more. But this is a good place to just say, I'm going to lay that burden down. I don't want to be here all by myself. And, and this doesn't even have to be just for prayer team ministry. This could just be open time at the altar where you're just coming and saying, I want, to, I want to lay something down. You're here as a guest. Somebody invited you. You never heard any of what we're talking about today. Look, you know, it, it, I don't want to overcomplicate this. If you've seen any movies about Jesus, you know there was a thief on the cross while he was being crucified. And that man said, remember me when you get in your kingdom. He never went to church. He was never baptized. He never had a Bible. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That girl that had two weeks to live, 10 years later, still alive. See, in God, it's not over even when it looks like it's over. It's not over. When God is in it, there's no limit. So you could just ask him into your heart right now. That's just it. It's just a prayer. Think about it. A loving father who's waiting for you to call out to him and say, I need help. I need your salvation. I have sin in my life and I can't save myself. So would you come in and help me? Would you empower me and plug me into a church where I can get fed, where I can be grown up in the things of the Lord, where I can take on my true identity that you had for me all along? I'm sick of counterfeit affections. I'm sick of trying to feed on what the world offers me. It offers nothing redemptive. Lord, I just thank you for anybody here that doesn't know you, that they would open their heart to receive you today. Can we just say that prayer? Father, I open my heart to you. I recognize a need in my life that I am not God and you are. You said that you are, I am. Everything that I need, you are. I don't know all the rules, but I know that what I heard is true. And that if I ask you, you will come into my life. I repent for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Be the Lord of my life. Open the truth of your word to me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and grow me into the person that was destined to be in this earth. My true identity found only in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's good to be reminded of that prayer. If that's anybody here, doesn't have to be your first time saying that prayer. The altar's open. That's all I want to say. The altar's open. Nobody has to talk to you or do anything, but just you can receive healing. But then we do have the prayer ministry team that's here. So would you guys come up now, those of you that are serving on the prayer ministry team. And then if you need prayer and you're going to be one of the teams, come on up this aisle. If you're not coming up, could just lift your hand. I'd like to bless you before you go. Lord, I thank you for every hand that's up right now. I thank you for the King of Kings radical remnant tribe that you have assembled here. And I pray as we go out today, our faith is going to be strengthened in who you made us to be in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Love you all.